Greg's an amazing man. It's not that he doesn't talk. <laughs> Just come up, ask him about his kids, ask him about his grandkids, ask him about his wife, and then try to get him to shut up. <laughs> he does talk. Uh, this will be our, our last Sunday this time round. Uh, we will be heading to, to Havelock North, which is by Napier, next weekend, and then flying out for home on May the 2nd, so that's the Monday after. But once again, uh, we leave. I, I said it, it's always bittersweet, no, no matter which way we go. When we come here, we leave family and friends, and when we go back home, we leave family and friends. So whichever side of the pond we have to leave from, there's always that place in our heart that, that aches and that other place in our heart that says, can't wait to get there. And we will feel that way again next year when we return because you're stuck with us. That's just the way it is. <laughs> this morning, uh, we are going to somewhat build off the seminar that we, <clears throat> just, for, just for our two kids back there, Mike and Jess, but I told you yesterday, cancel that. If you're looking for it to happen, no. It's not the same. For those who were not here for the Revelation series, there, I pray that what I say, there might be some things that you kind of go, and I really don't have the time this morning to re-preach and reteach the eight hours that we had together, which all those that were here say, praise God, thank, thank God from whom all blessings flow. <clears throat> so if you hear some things that you're not, that might sound a little different, I just ask you to go on the link that ChangePoint has graciously put up and and go through the series on Revelation. Jesus is coming. Amen. And he's, he's coming more than once. <laughs> and you already said, okay, now you've already lost me. <laughs> but the thing is, are we ready? So Father, as I come to you and stand in this place to open up your word, I ask that you will give me wisdom, clarity, God, I have a list of verses that I think that I should go to, but you know the direction you want to take. Holy Spirit, I ask that you will form the message clearly in my heart and in my mind so that as I bring it forth, it comes with the clarity that you bring when you breathe on a word. <clears throat> God, you are a God of order. I pray that you'll help me to deliver this message with order so that it is line upon line, precept upon precept, and that it begins to make a full picture. So once again, I recognize how desperately I need you to deliver your word, not just information. So I bow to you, Spirit of God, asking once again that you will flow like a river from this vessel of clay and teach. In Jesus' name, amen. As Jesus walked this earth, especially when you take the, the time from the time that he came in at the triumphal entry and look at that week that he spoke, he taught so much. And in that teaching, Jesus was confronted with those who were so religious they had religion, but the only thing, the only problem was they began to form religion according to their own hearts and their own minds. When the children of Israel were taken to Babylon as captives, they recognized that they were in Babylon as captives because they failed to do what God had told them to do. And they failed to keep the law of God. So what they did is they said, well, we're going to make sure we never break God's laws again. And so they began to build fences, 
That's what they called it. They began to make fences around the laws of God so that they would be sure that they never broke another law. These fences, a quick example is when it says that um, the law says that you are not to boil a kid in its mother's milk. Now, what they said is we got to make sure we never break that law. So what we will do is we will build a fence around it. So if we get to the fence, we know, okay, don't go any farther because you might break that law. And the fence that they built around that law was we will never have milk and meat in the same meal. And to this day, Orthodox Jews and conservative as well, they will not have milk and meat. You don't go to Israel and ask at, for a cheeseburger at McDonald's because they don't put cheese on meat and they don't even eat it in the same meal. That's what's called kosher. Matter of fact, they don't even put it on the same plate. If we're having something with meat tonight, then I will use this set of dishes. If we're going to have something with milk tomorrow, which will say we don't have any meat at all, then I use this set of dishes. So they made these oral laws and they passed down these laws, which later on became known as, as the, the Mishnah. And, and so you have all these laws, books and books and books and books of oral laws. So by the time Jesus was, was on this earth, these oral laws had become far more important than the law itself. And so when Jesus began to try to teach them, they couldn't hear because they had already filled up their hearing in their minds and their thoughts with their own formation of the law. You know, the sad part is we as Christians can do the same thing. We, we can begin to refashion the things that God has spoken and we try to make it easier. We try to make it, package it so that it's, it's more attractive. And pretty soon as we do all these things, we begin to, just like the Israelites, we begin to change the very things that God has said. I can give you an example. Now, when I was a child growing up in the church, unless you prayed a certain prayer a certain way, then you weren't saved. You had to say a certain thing. You had to, you say, I can tell you exactly what we would say. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. Please come into my heart. And unless you said, please come into my heart. But as soon as you said, please come into my heart, then you were saved and, and you were okay. It didn't matter what you did after that. Because you said the words, the, the magic formula, Jesus, come into my heart. Funny, that's not even the confession that we were told to confess. It says that if we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead and confess with our mouth that I make you Lord. It's not just a matter of saying, Jesus, come into my heart. It's a, salvation is a matter of confessing him as Lord of your life. And there are a lot of people who have been lulled into a false security because they said the words, Jesus, come into my heart. But they have never made him Lord of their life. It says, for with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made, resulting in salvation. But you see, we have repackaged things Jesus came to his people, the Jewish people, when he walked this earth, and he tried to talk with them. And that all they want to know is, well, on what authority do you say that? And what authority do you say that? It was um, in the midst of this that Jesus taught a parable. And if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 22, Matter of fact, the poor guys back there who run the, the I love you. Go, back, go to Matthew chapter 21. 
He has just given the parable of the vine dresser. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 42, Jesus says to them, did you never read in the scripture the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. Shall I say that again? Who's the kingdom going to be given to? Those who have said, Jesus, come into my heart? No, those who produce the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but whomever it falls, on, on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, they understood that he was speaking about them. When they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. Now go to chapter 22. Then Jesus spoke to them again in parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fattened livestock. All are butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. What an interesting parable. In this parable, there are three categories of people. The first category, the call, the invitation is sent out. But Unfortunately, there is no response. No, we're not answering that invitation. We see why that some say, well, I've got my own life to live. They went back to their own business. There are many who the call has gone out to, the invitation has gone out to, but they don't respond because they want to live their own lives. There is a second group, though. In this, this time, he says, well, go out and, and invite those good and bad. Let my invitation go out to all men. That invitation, we saw at the end, many are called. Do you know what that word called actually means? Literally, it means many are invited. There is an invitation. And many responded to this invitation. But there was one man, when the, the father looked over the wedding, and he looked and he sees this one man. Oh, he's responded to the call. He came. But what's the problem? He came without a wedding garment. He didn't come prepared for a wedding. He came, he treated the invitation as though it was common, ordinary. He continued to live his life, even to show up at the wedding, coming in his everyday garb. 
but not prepared for what God was calling him to. I wonder, what about us? How have we treated the call of God, the invitation? Some might say, well, I came. But the question is, what did you come dressed in? If Jesus were to call us to that wedding feast today, what's your clothes like? What would you come dressed in? You say, well, uh, I don't even know what a dress would look like to go to the wedding feast. Go with me to Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation chapter 19, we've looked at this before, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, it says, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. What does a wedding dress look like if you're going to marry the son of God? Kind of looks like his robe of righteousness. He gives us the robe of righteousness for what purpose? So we can learn how to live the life that pleases God as he did. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. But afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. His life on me should be teaching me how to live life. And I should be manifesting the fruit of that life in my own life and in my own deeds. That's what makes a wedding dress. Did you notice it says back in Revelation 19, verse uh, 8, and it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. She begins to live as he lived because his life teaches her. She's wrapped in his life to learn. We have no excuse for not living a righteous life. But look at verse 9. It says, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Interesting there that we see two categories here. We see those who are the, wedding, the, the bride, who have the clothing and, and the righteous deeds. But then we see another group that are invited to the wedding. The question is, which are we satisfied to be? Are we satisfied to be just the invited, or will we be the bride? You see, when God called us, he called us with a purpose. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul prays this prayer. It is, it's my prayer today as well. In Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 18. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Did you see what Paul was, he said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. Are we aware that we have a God who is filled with hope? We think hope belongs to us, but God has hope. What is faith? Faith is the assurance of things you hope for. 
God is assured of what he hopes for, but God has hope. What is hope? It's anticipation with expectation. God has an anticipation and he is expecting some things. He says, there is a hope. When he called us, he had a hope. How many of us are fulfilling the hope, not our hope, but the hope of God? But you might say, well, what is God's hope? What is the hope of his calling? Thank you for asking. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. What is the hope of his calling? In Romans chapter 8, begin in verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I'm going to stop there for a moment. Do you see that when he called us, he called us with a hope and he called us with a specific purpose? What is the specific purpose that God called us with? Let's keep reading. It says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Stop right there. Some people get real confused about predestination. It's not, God didn't go and say, you, I I want you. No, No, I don't want you. You, I don't want you. God is not willing that any should perish. But the sad part is, In God's foreknowledge, he knew there would be people who would refuse. It's kind of like the the potter who goes and has an image in his mind of a beautiful vessel that he wants to make, a very fine vessel. So he reaches into the pit and he begins to feel the lumps of clay that he has to work with. And as he feels this lump, it's... He says, no, that won't, that won't conform to that image because it's too gritty. And then he feels this lump and he says, that lump will. You see, God in his foreknowledge was able to know our makeup before we ever breathed the breath. In his foreknowledge, he predestined, predestined what? He predestined us to become conformed to the image of his son. Let's read it again, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. God didn't call us with the purpose to miss hell. Thank God we will. But that wasn't his purpose. His purpose was to conform us to the image of his son. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, did we give him the lordship of our life? Did we say, you be Lord, or did we kind of attach him to our life like a barnacle on a boat? Not willing to change, but we don't want to be caught without him. God said, when I called you, I called you with a hope. What is that hope? That hope is that when we are presented before him, we stand before him in his image. Anything short of that, any message short of that is an incomplete message and one that we have made. The hope of his calling. You know, we sang songs, you are my everything, you are my breath, you are the... Does it break our heart to think that we might be falling short of the hope that he has? Whom he foreknew, he predestined. Whom he predestined, he called. Whom he called, he justified. 
God has chosen, chosen us from the very beginning to be sanctified. Let's look at another scripture. Go with me to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, begin in verse 13. It says, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It is for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch all that? Let me read it again. That's a powerful scripture. Again, verse 13, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel. It was for what that he called us? That he might sanctify us, that he might set us apart, that we might be conformed to his image. How are we doing? This week that we just lived, how many times did we stop to consider, God, am I being conformed? Is my life gradually and continually being changed into whatever it is you predestined me to be and to do? There's a, an amazing scripture. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 17. Because we've been talking about end times, and when you look at the end times, we looked at the opening of the seven seals, and then we saw the blowing of the seven trumpets, and we saw the pouring out of the seven bowls. And then we saw that there's the time of the beast, and, and then there's a gathering together when the world will gather together to make war against God. The battle of Armageddon. And in Revelation chapter 17, it tells us a bit about that war. And when we look at Revelation 17, verse 14, it says, in, in 12 and 13, it's telling us who the ones are, the nations that are gathering together to make war with him. And in verse 14, it says, these will wage war against the lamb and the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. Now, we already saw many are called Few are chosen. But what's the difference between the called and the chosen? And what's this group called the faithful? And how do I know which group I fit in? Well, I'm going to try to help us out with this. Are you ready for this? I'm going to do some, I'm going to do some calling, some inviting. Andrew, would you like to respond to the invitation to come up here? Come on, come on up. How about your dear wife? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Please invite her. Yeah. <laughs> Would you respond to the invitation? Sure. Jeff, how about, will you respond to that invitation? Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Would you like to respond to the invitation? Of course you would. Of course you would. You know you would. Greg, are you ready? Come on. Linda, wouldn't be the same. The invitation, okay. Many are called. And these, the call went out, and they responded to the invitation. Love those excited ones. <laughs> but here, and, and this is the same thing that God did in the Old Testament. If you want to look up the words called and chosen in the Old Testament, you'll find that these words were used back then. They were used 
for the called, it's referred to, the, the Levites are referred to as the called. But there were chosen. Matter of fact, you remember the sin uh, when, when, when Korah came to, to Moses and he says, who do you think you are? Who do you and Aaron think you are? We're all the called. And God said to them, and because he was saying, you, you priests, there's Levites and there's priests, you priests, you sons of Aaron, you think you're special. And God said to them, he said, you called men of God, talking to the Levites, he said, today we're going to find out who is chosen. Now, let me show you what happens here. God comes and he says, now, Linda, you know, you're one of my called ones, but um, I'm, I'm choosing you out of this group because I am going to set you apart completely for myself. You are now a chosen. <laughs> Amy, come, you're chosen one. I, I, same with you. No more. You're not going to be working in, in, in the mall or in a, as a secretary. I want you to serve me 100% of your life and your husband right beside yes. you. <laughs> yeah, no, did you hear that? I heard that. Favoritism. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Now, Greg, could you, can this group kind of move down? <laughs> I, oh, one more. Jeff. Oh. Chosen one. All right. So we've got, we've got our called. We've got our chosen. But let's say Greg says, you know, those pastors, they have it easy. All they have to do is show up on Sunday, talk a little bit, and their job is done. I want to be, I want to be chosen. I want to be special. So Greg says, I am going to choose myself. And so Greg calls himself to ministry. And, and yet God had said, you know, Greg, I, I've got this whole factory that needs your testimony Greg says, not me. I'm no factory rat anymore. I'm a chosen. Oh. And he says to Marlene, sorry, Marlene. I want to say Eddie's daughter. <laughs> Marlene, God says, yeah, Marlene, I, I need you. I need you to be in this workplace. I'm going to put you in this office and you're going to be a secretary, but I want you to do everything you do. I want you to do as though you're working for me. And I want you to let your light shine in that place. And he says, Caleb, Caleb, I, I've got, oh, do I have great things for you. And, and what, I, I, what I want you to do is I want you to to work with youth, but I'm going to put you in a school to do it. And you're going to, you're going to be a teacher. This is not prophetic. Just, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're going to be a teacher and, and I need you in that school because I can't get, I can't get the Bible in there unless people like you bring it. So I want you to go and I want you to shine. I want those kids to say, teacher, teacher, what makes you so different? And I want you to be able to bring them the principle of my word. Sue, Ruth, Sue, close to Ruth. Oh, there's Sue, Ruth. Ruth, I'm, I mean, I, I'm going to, would you, would you just be, I need you at home. I need you in that neighborhood. I need you being, uh, uh, start a Bible study in your house, do so, but let your light shine so bright in that neighborhood. Would you do that for me? Of course you would. Yes. Andrew over here, he's in ministry and he said, man, if people only knew what goes on in ministry. <laughs> you know, it's easier selling shoes. So I'm, I'm done. I've been hurt. I've been hurt one too many times. Like the bride in Song of Solomon, I'm going to wash my own feet. I quit. 
I'm going to get in bed, forget it. I'm going to go over here and sell shoes. Hey, I got to do this to somebody. It may as well be you. You'll still love me. <laughs> and, and Jeff. Jeff says, you know, maybe selling shoes isn't so bad. There's more money in it. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and so Jeff says, you know, I think I'm going to go sell shoes. So... So he goes and sells shoes. All right. Now, watch this. Are you ready? It's time for God to come down and examine lives. He comes to Ruth and he says, Ruth, oh my goodness. Can't believe how faithful you've been to that neighborhood. You have... You have Matter of fact, there are so many kids now that have gone on with God and you brought them to church and you, you, you helped the mothers and the, and the families and, and you really embraced that with your whole heart and you were faithful. So I want you to come right here, faithful one. <sighs> Caleb, Caleb, Caleb. Caleb. Started so good. Ah. But that money looked better on that other side. And man, you, you, you're, when you got married, you wanted the things. But you, you still kept me in, in your life. But faithful to what I said? Mm, no. But thank God, so as by fire... Ah, Andrew, 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 this is not where I put you. No. you. You were not just called, you're chosen. Would you get back over where you belong, chosen one? Sure. You're chosen. And you too. <laughs> oh. You did excellent. You did so good. You, I, I just, there are so many people that are in the kingdom today that are going to be passed over when the, the judgment comes because you were faithful. So come on up here. Oh, Gregory, 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 called one, called one, called one. <laughs> Not only, I mean, Caleb at least stayed in the, where he belonged, but you just wanted to call yourself and man... You've made a mess. So why don't you go back in the, in the called area? <laughs> oh, but Amy, you were so faithful. In spite of your husband wanting you to come and sell shoes with him, you stayed faithful because you, because you knew that your, the words of your mother-in-law were the right words. And, and you were... And faithful, together you were faithful. So you two come here. I want you to join this group. Come on, Linda, you're faithful. Faithful to the end. Now, I want you to see this. <laughs> what can I say? How did I do that? <laughs> Sorry. In, in Christ, there is neither male nor female. <laughs> yeah. Phew. But when it says when Jesus comes back with him, I want you to notice this, that in this group here called Faithful, we have some that were called. We have some that were chosen. But did you see that whether you're called or whether you're chosen, the, the highest is not called or chosen. What is the highest? Faithful. Faithful. What, if you're called, if you are faithful to where God puts you and you're faithful in your job and you're faithful being what God called you to be on that job, I don't care what you do. 
If it's, if it's collecting garbage, be the best garbage collector on the block. Let them see your light. May, may they see that no matter what you do, you do it to God. Farmer, salesman, whatever your job is, the question isn't whether you're called or chosen. The question is, are we faithful? Thank you, folks. You, you can take your seat. And... Matthew 25 says it all. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is speaking another parable. It's about the parable that he gives to each one, starting in verse 14. It says, for it's just like the man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. Every one of you sitting in this place today, God has given you abilities. God will not require of you more than you are able to give because he will require of you according to your ability. But for them to take what the master gave, the master says, I'm entrusting to you my greatest riches. Every one of us has at least one talent, one of his riches. What is that rich, that that? What is that? That rich, it, richness is that Christ has saved us. If you don't have anything else to give, you've got that. The one who had one said, I went and I hid it. How many of us are the, like that one who hides that one thing, that one message that we can give out? You may not be a preacher. You may not be a teacher. But God hasn't called you to do that, but he has called every single one of us to be a testimony of the salvation of Jesus Christ. And when we get before Christ, will there be even one more talent that you will bring with you? Will we have brought even one more person into the kingdom of God because we shared those riches? But look at verse 19. It says, now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more saying, master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. And his master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Enter into the joy. The one who had two comes back and says, here, I, I increased it two more. What does he say? Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Those of you who were at the Revelation series know that I believe Jesus is coming soon. If we, have, if we have seven years, if we have 10 years, or if we had to stand before Jesus seven years from now, let's say that tribulation came and now we have to stand before him. What would his words be to you? Would he be saying, good, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the master. Or would we find ourselves on the outskirts of town, outside the wall? I close with this one scripture. Turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we're 
We're going to begin in, I'm going to begin in verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those have, who have received a faith the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the experiential knowledge. It says knowledge, but it means experiential knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the true or the experiential knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and by his own excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this reason also, applying all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, in your moral excellence knowledge, and in your knowledge self-control, and in your self-control perseverance, and in your perseverance godliness, and in your godliness brotherly kindness. Did you notice you have to supply those things? You supply them. And in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true or the experiential knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. You know, God has spelled it out very clearly. He said, I, I've done the initial work. I've done everything. I've paid your debt so that you can become a child of God. But how many of you found that when you were born into a family that the, uh, your mom and your dad expected this thing called obedience? It says it's, a, it's an illegitimate son who has no discipline from his father. Unfortunately, there's a lot of kids that have a dad in the house, but, but they are illegitimate because the father brings no discipline, corrective discipline to his children. God is a good father. God is a father who says, I will discipline you so that you will live the way I intended you to live. If you are without discipline, you're not his child. We also saw that, that it says, make certain. Peter writes and says, make certain about it. If, if these things aren't growing in you, if you don't find that you're moving towards a maturing, then make certain about his calling and choosing you. Today, it's a serious day. You say, come on, Shirley, do some fun things. Folks, I'm here to tell you, we don't have enough time to just play games anymore. And today I'm asking you to examine your own heart. Have you been satisfied with saying, well, at least I'm not going to hell? That's not what he saved you for. He saved you so that he could be master of your life and conform you to the image of his son. And so, Father, you know the hearts of these people. You know where they stand. You know those that have been just content to, to miss hell, but never have embraced you as Lord, master of their life. I pray today that there will be some serious soul-searching and that God, if it was just mere words to keep from going to hell, and it wasn't making you, Lord, that today they will make certain of your call on their life. 
Today they will make certain to confess you as Lord. Today they will make certain that they will, will determine from this day on they are going to see what your life is like and how you please the Father and that they will choose to live life according to the pattern of the Son of God. Lord, I thank you that you bring with you the called, those who responded to the invitation, the chosen, those that are your elect, as the word is sometimes translated. But I thank you, Lord, that there will be those that will be faithful, and those are the ones will, that will put on the dress and be called into the joy of the Lord. Holy Spirit, search the innermost being. Search the hearts. Jesus said that you would come and that you would show us Christ, but that also you would bring conviction. I ask, Lord, where those need, that need to have an awakening call, that they will hear it today and that they will respond to the call, and that they'll begin to prepare to come to the wedding in a proper garment. In Jesus' name, amen.